everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the University of Regina's uh, 2023 Alumni Effect Virtual Speaker Series. My name is Douglas Fernick. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Science and a Professor of Mathematics at the University of Regina. Over the next uh, hour, you'll hear from alumnus Pierre Lemire, who is the CEO of Kent Imaging, which is located in Calgary, Alberta. But before I introduce Pierre, I'd like to acknowledge that we are privileged to work, study, and learn on Treaty 4 lands, which are the traditional territories of the Nehewak, the Anishinaabek, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So that's for our, our main campus, University of Regina, but we also have a presence on Treaty 6 lands through our university's activities in Saskatoon. So I'd like to acknowledge that as well. The University of Regina's Alumni in, uh, Engagement Department is pleased to be able to offer the Alumni Effect uh, Speaker Series virtually. This is my first time hosting a lecture in this series, and I hope that your time with us today inspires you to return for future sessions. I'd like to point out that these sessions are being recorded and will be posted on the University of Regina alumni website so that you can watch the presentations again or share them with your friends and family. You'll be able to, sync, be able to see the alumni website uh, link in the chat if you'd like to access the video later. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our April uh, speaker in the 2023 uh, Alumni Effect Virtual Speaker Series, Pierre Lemire. We're very glad, Pierre, that you're joining us today. Pierre is an award-winning technology commercialization expert with more than 35 years of experience in the high-tech sector. In, in a, he specializes right now in the world of imaging. He joined Kent Imaging as CEO in 2015 after having earlier roles as a Chief Technology Officer at Autodesk Incorporated and being the co-founder of Calgary Scientific. His passion for building high-tech imaging products has been the driving force of his professional life and has evolved into a long and rewarding career. In 2022, Pierre was named Medical Technology Executive of the Year uh, in Canada by Executive Global Magazine, recognizing Pierre's contributions to technological innovation and sophisticated approaches to health using technology. Today, Pierre will discuss his experience as a student and an alumnus of the University of Regina and share with us some of the challenges and steps that he took to achieve his career aspirations. Following the discussion, we will have about 15 minutes available for a question and answer session. And if you'd like to pose questions, please uh, put them in the chat and I will get to as many of those questions as we can get to in the time allotted to us. So with no further uh, ado, I pass it over to Pierre Lemire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Douglas. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and share a little bit of my story. You know, we were chatting a little bit before uh, that, you know, you never know where you're going to end up in your journey. And, and certainly, uh, I never expected to be in imaging the way where I am today and the level of, um, of experience I have in healthcare. And so um, what I've done to try and communicate uh, the story of, of, my, of my path is put together a little um, PowerPoint where I'll give you a quick brief really over, overview of my background, talk a little bit about my experience at the U of R, and then uh, take you through my path and some of the mentors who kind of helped guide me along the way. And then a few takeaways that uh, I'm always happy to share. Uh, first is I'm, I was born in a, in a small town in southern Saskatchewan called Val Marie. <clears throat> and we um, commuted, we were hockey players as kids. And my dad commuted to Swift Current, where we uh, would play hockey there. And dad got tired of commuting. So we, we moved to Swift Current. And I did my junior high in Swift Current. And then I went to Athel Marie College of Notre Dame in Wilcox, Saskatchewan, uh, for high school. And so uh, when it came to making a decision about where I go to university, it was a pretty easy one for me. My two older brothers were already at the U of R. And so uh, I went and, and joined the, uh, went to University of Regina where I got an opportunity to play uh, hockey with my two brothers. And I was initially headed into 
um, the university with the expectation that I'd get a, a commerce degree, become an accountant. And as part of my undergrad studies, I had to take some computer science classes. And I remember CS102 learning how to program in basic. And I really liked it. And so for an elective, my second term, I took another computer science class. And I liked that as well and decided to make a switch of faculties after my first year. So I switched from the faculty of business to the faculty of science and started my, my education in computer science. And uh, in 1983, when I went to U of R, this was the computing lab. We had PDP 11s uh, with reel to reel tape that we had to bootstrap our, ourselves. And the amount of storage on them was limited. And so it was on these little terminals with uh, green screens that we learned how to program in BASIC and Pascal, assembly and C, and learned about COBOL and databases and all kinds of things um, that were relevant at the time. And you know, even uh, there were some interesting things I learned about myself at university. Um, one of them is a story I like to tell about CS300, where we were had a nice project that had five five different components to the project. And the professor said, you'll never complete all of them. And I said, yes, I will. And I proceeded to try and do all five components of the project. And at 3 a.m. the night before the project was due, we were out of disk space or, or tape space. And we all had to delete some, some room on the VAX in order to make some room for, the, for us to compute, continue to work. And I actually deleted the wrong file and lost my whole project. Fortunately, I had a printout that was almost complete that I could hand in, but I learned a valuable lesson. Uh, you know, you don't always have to be first. You don't have to finish the whole project. Follow the directions and you'll have a better outcome. And if you're a programmer, um, you know, one of the lessons I learned there was get some output. Get some output quickly so you can see what's going on. Um, while I was at the university, someone brought in one day one of these little computers. And that was an early Macintosh. We didn't have access to them at the at the university at the time. Someone had just brought one in uh, one evening when I was in the lab. And you'll notice it has a mouse. And that was the first time I saw a mouse attached to a computer. And I laughed, saying, and no, no one's going to use a mouse. And funny how you know now you you won't you you can't use a computer without one. We're so used to it. And that's an, another kind of lesson I learned of of the biases that you kind of learn and, and making sure that those biases don't get in the way of, of actually making good decisions. Uh, but at the time I did learn how to program a little bit on a microcomputer. They had a microcomputer lab that, that the university brought in in 1986. And we had uh, floppy disks that we used to slide around to put your program on one and the, and the compiler on the other, how things have changed. Um, in this, my uh, third year, I actually was encouraged by one of the professors at the university to do some summer research and uh, combined with a university, uh, sorry, an engineering professor, um, did a summer project and that got me introduced to AutoCAD and a Regina-based company called Software Support, interesting name at the time. Um, and there I was started developing mapping and GIS extensions that use uh, a programming extension of AutoCAD called AutoLisp on IBM PCs and XTs. We were programming in DOS and uh, learned a lot about small business, how to program inside of AutoCAD. We were running on, on Toshiba laptops and programming in Microsoft C. Um, and that was you know, some really good learnings about um, how to um, persevere because you know, we, we had to by day sell software and by night program. And, uh, and it was a lot of experience. But finally, one, one day, a buddy of mine said, why don't you just go work for Autodesk, the guys who write AutoCAD? And that got me to San Francisco, where I worked with Autodesk to build a product called AutoCAD Map. And um, very successful product. I see the publication here by some of my peers. And uh, was, I had a great experience at Autodesk, where I started off as a programmer analyst and then moved through to become a chief technology officer of the GIS division. And through that course of uh, a career there, um, we had significant changes in technology. We uh, saw a transition from DOS to Windows, which I don't know if you remember DOS, but <laughs> was very basic to a, to a, a GUI interface, a graphical user interface. Um, we uh, were developing systems, not only ran on PCs, but also ran on Sun workstations. 
And what you carried around every day, if you were lucky, if you had a pager and a phone, if you could afford a phone or one was available to you, um, and if you had to get a hold of your manager who had a phone, you had to page them. Um, and they had a, a Palm Pilot or a BlackBerry to keep track of their, their schedule and calendar and notes. And uh, the other thing you had is a wallet. So those were the kind of the three things that you had that you carried around with you. You have your or four things. You had your pager, your phone, your BlackBerry, your Palm Pilot, and your wallet. Um, you needed a few extra pockets. But one of the big things that changed when I was at Autodesk was the introduction of the internet. And Netscape was the first browser to come along to uh, really capitalize on it and provide a user interface to the internet. And that led me to web-based GIS. So taking the mapping technology we had and applying it to the internet. And this is before Google Maps came around. So I learned a lot about building web-based applications, uh, new technologies like Java Beans and J2A servers and so on. Um, and uh, really, when I when I left Autodesk and co-founded Calgary Scientific, I took a lot of that those concepts and then applied them to medical imaging. And when Apple first came out with the iPad Mini and sort of the iPad and then the iPad Mini, those were great form factors for a clinician to be able to look at medical images. They could actually see enough detail with enough resolution to make diagnostic decisions. And so it's that at Calgary Scientific that I learned about how to create uh, regulatory products uh, that were FDA cleared, that were Health Canada cleared. And by the end of my, uh, my, my tenure at Calgary Scientific, we had clearances for Europe, a CE mark, for Australia, for Brazil, for Japan, and also for Chinese, Chinese FDA. So those, those are great learning experiences and, um, and things that I, took with me into Kent Imaging where I am today. We currently manufacture this, uh, this technology here. It's a camera. It uses near infrared light. You see there's wave, there's LEDs in the front. We flash different wavelengths of near infrared light into tissue and, and check the reflectance of the tissue. And basically what we're looking for is hemoglobin in the red, in the, in the blood that has oxygen or doesn't have oxygen. And we then can create images that clinicians can look to and see what's happening with uh, a patient's tissue. In this case, we have a patient who uh, has wounds on their feet, and we're trying to heal those wounds using a, uh, a therapy called hyperbaric therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And you can see uh, just one day versus the other post their therapy, we're seeing a much redder image. And that indicates that the, that patient's actually getting better, that they're getting more blood and oxygen into their wound as a result of that therapy. Um, one of the things that uh, I learned, and I'm still learning at Calgary at Cant Imaging now, is the hardware piece. So I, I had always done software, and at Cant Imaging, we're manufacturing this device. So uh, learning how we design and create circuit boards that are meet regulatory compliances, how we create and the molding and, and the design for the actual look and feel of the device and how we put it all together into an assembly that we allows us to actually produce and sell it en masse. Um, and so when I look back at the, the changes, you know, from the beginning where, you know, at the University of Regina was programming on these terminals to the technology that we have in our pocket now, where you no longer need a wallet, you don't need, you have your scheduler, your phone, your music, all in one device. And I'm just giving an example, iPhone, obviously, if you're, if you're an Android user, you have similar capabilities. It's, uh, it's phenomenal where the technology has come. And it's been very interesting to watch all the changes over time, over the last 40 years. <clears throat> what, um, along the way, you know, we've had to adapt to this change of technology, uh, because if you didn't adapt, you were left you were left behind. And in some cases, those changes were very rapid, like the internet made an instant change to uh, the way that we looked at imaging and how we could get imaging out to people to use. Uh, and sometimes you have a little bit more time to, to watch it come and play. Um, it'll be interesting to see where this technology continues to progress you know, certainly there's a lot of buzz about chat GDP today. And, and frankly, we have used it here at Kent to 
help with uh, creating documents. Um, and uh, from my perspective, where we see this kind of uh, machine learning being able to be used, uh, it can have significant uh, enhancements to the way that we analyze and diagnose and treat patients. Because as we continue to build a wealth of information and databases of, of medical data, how can we mine that effectively and, and use it to create better devices that can not only diagnose patients when they have disease, but can help guide their this day-to-day -day wellness so that we don't have disease, as much disease in the first place. So when I um, when I look at the mentors who've guided me uh, over the years, certainly my father has been probably the biggest influence, the, the one who's been in my head the most. And he had a lot of different mantras, but uh, here are the three that kind of stuck with me. Um, be a leader, not a follower, which he followed up immediately with, hey, be an engine, not a caboose. Uh, um, if you don't know what a caboose is, look it up. <laughs> um, and then my favorite, hey, while sunshine. With that, my dad was a farmer. And when the sun was shining and it was time to get the hay off the field, you better be up at five or four, whatever you needed to be to get it, to get it off the field. And, and that's something that's really stuck with me. Um, it's something that I continue to look at, you know, when do I need to be up early and getting things done? And when can I really pull back a little bit and wait for that next, next sunshine? Uh, the other uh, big influence in my life was Pierre Alpha Murray, who founded Notre Dame College in Wilcox, where I went to high school. And his motto there was Lucter and Emergo, which is Latin for struggle and emerge. And he, he built a, a small school in a very small town in Wilcox, Saskatchewan in the dirty 30s and really had a, a struggle to make that college work. And anybody who comes out of Notre Dame has that passion uh, and understanding that you know things don't always come easy and, and sometimes you have to grin and bear and get things done. Some of the, just a couple of key takeaways that I wanted to pass along that maybe not always um, are, are, are passed along, but really hit home for me. The first is this concept of positive self-expectancy. And um, Dennis Waitley is uh, an author who wrote The Psychology of Winning. And this was uh, books on cassette I listened to <laughs> in the 80s. Uh, you can look up what a cassette is as well. Um, and one of the key things that the key messages that he had provided was have positive self-expectancy. Expect that things are going to go well for you. And that's something that it took a while for me to really come around to that. Being a shy farm kid, um, that always that wasn't something that always was uh, something that I stuck with. But over the years, as my confidence has improved, as my roles have had more and more influence, and as my mentors continue to provide confidence for me, um, it's something that's really uh, sticks. Uh, it, it resonates with me, and, and I want to pass that along. Feel free to look up Dennis Waitley and some of his messages. Uh, the second is is to really get as much work experience as you can, even while you're getting your education. If this is a plug for the co-op program, but I'm a big fan of the co-op program, and I'll tell you why from an employer's perspective. So as an employer, if I get a chance to uh, work with a student and mold them and educate and train them, then it's low cost, but also it's a great interview process that when they come out of school, I know that I can get some good talent. And, and so I've hired many students as part of the internship program at all, uh, all the jobs I've been at from Autodesk, from Calgary Scientific and Kent Imaging. Uh, we have interns with us right now as part of the co-op program from the University of Calgary. And when they're done school, we've, we're making them offers before they're even graduated because we know they're good students and, that, and they're gonna have a lot of, of value to the company. Uh, next is surround yourself with strong team players. And I think that's that holds for when you're in school on team projects, uh, when you get into business and when you become a leader within a business. Um, you don't always have to be the smartest person in the room. And sometimes it's humbling when you're around people who are who are much smarter than you and in, in different aspects. But there's no way that you can know everything, especially in high tech. And so I found with uh, by surrounding people who are better experienced in areas that I'm not good at, or even the areas that I am good at, but but they really complement what I'm doing. We come, we make better decisions, we make better products, and we have better success. 
so that's a quick uh, overview of sort of my path and and some of the takeaways that I wanted to pass along. And um, I think we can open it up for questions. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, that was, <laughs> I never mentioned before, but I am I also a graduate of the University of Regina and I think we over overlapped a little bit. And um, certainly I, I think any student who went through Computer Science 300 has their own uh, special story. <laughs> I'll just say that that um, my special story in that course, so I'm I'm familiar with the 3 a.m. nights in the lab, but um, my my one pass assembler had a little bug in it, and um, what it what I programmed my programming error was I had the program as it was executing. Uh, right over top of itself where it was stored in memory, which always led to a malfunction. <laughs> and that was a hard one to debug. <laughs> so, anyway. That's why having good output at the beginning <laughs> with, with registers, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just looking if, uh, if there's anything in the chat and there, there's, there's nothing yet, but I might ask... Um, a, a little bit about what we were discussing uh, be before um, before twelve ten today, and just thinking, a typical person is doing an undergraduate degree. They have they have some thoughts in mind about what they might like to do. They have no idea really about where they're going to end up, you know, twenty thirty years down down the road, and you did. One of your one of your takeaways was get as much work experience as possible early on, and you did mention that you had a um, an experience of working with an engineering professor on research. So, I'm just wondering um, if so. I have a two faceted question. Um, if you think back to when you were an undergraduate student, did you have some sort of specific type of career goal in mind? That's the first one, and then second. How transformative was that that research experience that you had as an undergraduate to your to your long term uh, career path? Yeah. So to answer your first question, I really didn't have an idea of where I was going with a computer science degree. I, I knew I liked programming, and but I wasn't sure you know where it was going to end up. Um, I did have an opportunity to go to Waterloo and 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 do a master's. I had a scholarship to go there. But when I looked at the topics that they were sort of giving me to study, I, I wasn't interested in any of those particular topics. And the kind of leading into your second question of the influence of that research, that was, that was the, the thing that started me on mapping and GIS because um, I enjoyed taking the output of my program and getting a graphical output. And that's what AutoCAD gave is you had a way to actually look at your, your design, looking at the residential subdivision that we were designing and, and see how it would look. And so that sort of aspect of, of making graphics represent data was a key, key and it's been the key to my career. And so without that, I don't know that I would have gone down this path without that summer research that kind of started me down the path because I really didn't know where I was headed. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Uh, here's a question um, from Alexis. My, how has health technology changed over the past 35 years that you've been working in this industry? I, I will say that health tech changes much slower than other industries. And uh, that's, that's due to, uh, I think, a couple of things. One, just the regulatory burden of of getting technology to market is is big, you know. If you create an oil and gas application or finance application, as soon as you're done, you can you can release that to market. But when it comes to healthcare, because of safety and patients, you, you need to have an extra level of testing and and regulatory oversight that's required before you can bring a technology to market. But what's what's changed has to be the way that data is is used and managed within healthcare. You know, we've been doing x-rays and ultrasound images uh, for a long time. I think that the technology around MRI and CT 
especially using contrast uh, and geography has increased or improved significantly. The resolution and the time that it takes to image is much, much better now than it was before. But the result of that is also creating a lot more data. So when you go in and, and have an MRI done, the amount of data that's captured now is much, much more than it was, it's simply more than it was you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. And so the question is, what do you do with all that data? And so we've got um, databases now of, of medical imaging and most, most hospitals um, have now electronic medical records. So we've gone from paper to digital uh, records. And as a result, now we have, the, we have the opportunity to apply machine learning on that data and provide better outcomes. That part of medical is, I'd say, behind other industries because the access to that data is limited. People are very concerned about sharing that personal data, even if it's what we call anonymized or the names have been, have been uh, removed. People are still very concerned about being able to share that data. And as a result, being able to apply algorithms to that data has been uh, significantly restricted. And that, that's one of the things I'm hoping will change. Um, in Alberta here, we have one database of everybody's medical record in the NetCare portal. And it's a wealth of data that could be mined to significantly improve outcomes. And we're just not ready to release that data yet. That we're trying to change that. That is, um, that's a very interesting uh, response very informative um at just the uh, how our how our, our policies a little bit um can hold us back in advancing in certain areas um oh, thank you um we have a question from uh, sarah uh, she asks what is the thing that interests you most about the about your work uh, there's a lot of things about it um, because of the nature of, of where we have. So I actually have, if you can see, this is the device here. Yeah. So there's all kinds of, of issues and, and learnings around building this device. So, you know, with COVID, the ability to get access to parts to build these devices has been, has been significantly limited. You know, we don't have people who got sick means that there's less people to manufacture the components that we need to build these products. And so, you know, to get a computer chip um, now for this technology is a six month wait. Imagine if you're, you're trying to build a product and, and manage your inventory when you've got a, you, you have a six month wait to get the chip that you need to build it. So there's all kinds of challenges around, around managing our supply chain and, and getting, um, making sure that we have the components in time to meet the demand. The, the solution that we're providing is very novel. It's using near-infrared imaging to look at, at oxygenation in tissue. It's very new. It's got a lot of challenges with it. And, um, and so from that perspective, that's been very exciting. I'm, I'm, I don't want to say a geek, but I'm a geek at heart. I'm, <laughs> I'm really into technology. And, uh, and so solving problems is, is something I really enjoy. And that's probably the biggest thing I enjoy. Uh, but also, you know, the experiences I've had from being in an operating room and watching a surgeon do, um, you know, a surgical procedure or being in a wound care clinic and watching patients try to heal or, or deal with a wound that's like, it, it's just really nasty. And the fact that these people do this day after day is, is unbelievable. So the experiences I've had of, of meeting with people who, who um, are doing really challenging jobs has been, has been great. And I've had an opportunity to travel. So I've, I've been to China, I've been to Russia, I've been to Australia even as, as recent as three weeks ago. Um, it, that part is also a lot of fun because you get to, to, to see a lot of different cultures and learn a lot about, more about yourself as you put yourself in those environments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the next question is from Luann, who thanks you for your presentation. Uh, what are your thoughts on mentorship? Was there one person in your life that's helped you personally and in your career? Yeah, I think uh, mentorship is is very important. And, and I've been really fortunate that I've had many people who have been my mentors or advisors over the years. And, you know, that that to me comes in a lot of different flavors, as simple as a peer who says, hey, you're doing a good job to um, you know, an investor in our company who gives me guidance about where we should be putting our assets. Um, I've had sort of that whole range 
And, um, and the biggest thing is, is just, I talked about confidence and, and positive self, self expectancy, hard to say, positive self expectancy. And that comes, that came for me through mentors and, and advisors who've given me the confidence that I needed to, to really persevere when, when things were tough or to even, you know, take that plunge. When the, the biggest one for me was probably when I was living in Edmonton with the first company with software support. And I had an opportunity to go work for Autodesk in California. Well, for me, as a small kid in Saskatchewan, California was, my, you know, was another planet. And so, you know, my buddy said, let's go. And he, and he flew down with me and actually uh, negotiated a contract for me. I'll say his name. Mike Colombo was a buddy who did that for me. And, uh, and that could really put me over the hump. And once you work in an American company, um, things change because you need to be more aggressive. You you uh, need to stick up for yourself more if you're going to be if you're going to be heard, and and that really gave me the confidence now that that I have in the leadership positions that I that I hold. Thank you. Our next question is from Andrew, who uh, also thanks you for being here today. I am wondering if you can uh, specifically touch on some of your experience in commercialization. How did you get into this space and what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started? Yeah, that this is about a week course probably <laughs> in, in what I've learned. Um, so when it comes to commercialization, the key thing is, is to have a, uh, really understand the problem you're solving. A lot of times, especially if we're if we're in a technology, we come up with an idea and then go try and solve it, find the problem to, that the technology might fit. And it works way better when you have a problem and someone comes to you and says, can you solve this problem for me? And the scope of the problem gets narrowed real quickly. And what you need to get done to get a minimal viable product is, is much more clear. And so, you know, the biggest thing is to create that, spend the minimum amount you need to create that viable product that gives you a, a that gives you a commercial product, um, there's there's a methodology called crossing the chasm by Thomas uh, Jeffrey Moore, uh, which I subscribe to because I've seen it over and over again. Where you you come up to the market with a product and your early adopters love it, and they start paying you some money for it, and you go, "Yay, I got a business." But those early adopters run out and your revenue goes down and you go, what the heck's going on? Do we really have a business? And what's happened is you're in that, you're in the chasm, as, as he calls it. And so you need to make sure that you're doing those things before you get into the chasm that's going to allow you to bridge that chasm as quickly as possible, because it will happen. I've seen it over and over again. And the key is to make sure that you've got a, a really strong reference base that really love the product and can, can stand behind the value proposition for that product. If you have that, then you'll you'll minimize the amount of time it takes for you to, to cross the chasm. You know, a few people have been able to get by it. You know, you got you got Facebook, got Google, Microsoft, whatever. But everybody has their their struggles, and the normal business will have that struggle. You'll see a little bit of revenue, it'll go away, and then if you're not doing those things and you're not continuing to do your sales and marketing that's required to actually get the product adopted. And more importantly, that your investors know that that's what's happening, that you're in the chasm, so they don't lose faith in you. That's that's the key to having a successful commercialization. Um, and there's lots I would have done earlier. The key thing is for people to really understand how long it takes to commercialize. As I mentioned, when you're in health tech, it's good. You're, if you're not thinking a 10-year horizon to commercialize a health tech product, then you need to revisit your thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Again, uh, that, that, that's fascinating to hear. Um, there's a question from Wanda that relates to something you touched on um, uh, already, but maybe there's you'd like to say a little bit more about it. Um, do you see AI playing a role in developing imaging technology and what it might look like? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it already is. Um, so in the radiology space, there are already companies who have commercialized AI algorithms for um, for looking at specific uh, artifacts in imaging, for example, looking at lesions in a lung scan, 
um, looking at cardiac issues and so on. And they've been successfully cleared by the FDA, which is the other challenging part when you have um, medical technology. But I think the same applies uh, in other spaces. When I look at the ability for um, for your, your phone to be able to detect a plant that you're looking at because you hold it and take a picture of it. Or as I saw in the, this last night on the news, there was uh, a blind person using a cell phone to look at and understand what, what's in a can, right? Is it a can of tomatoes or is it, you know, is it something else? The, yeah. the phone can detect it, right? So I think AI will continue to have an impact on what we're doing and it's going to help us to create better solutions um, uh, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, I myself have a question that no one has really raised yet, so perhaps I'll take advantage of my moderator role and, and <laughs> pose a question. Um, Again, like mine are always come in two parts. So um, did you have any, you know, notable setbacks in your career journey? And if so, how did you manage to, to pick yourself up and move forward? Um, yeah, I have. Um, and these are very personal stories, but I'll, I'm happy to share them. Um, when When I left Autodesk, it wasn't necessarily... Um, on the best of terms, and uh, you know, I, I thought I put nine years of 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 hard work into the company, and basically, when it's when the company decides it's your time to go, it's your time to go, and there's really not much you can do about it. And so, um, you know, there was it was a very um, between the gap of Autodesk and Calgary Scientific, there was a gap there, and it was it was unnerving. You know, where am I going to get my next job? Um, I did have a cushion from Autodesk, but still there was, you know, there was a window on when it would come. And as an, an executive, a tech executive in Calgary, it's not like you're in, you know, Silicon Valley. <laughs> I was back in Calgary trying, looking for a tech job as a president or a CEO or CTO. And um, I was fortunate to be able to land this job with, with uh, Kent, sorry, with, with Calgary Scientific and start to start that journey. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's, I think everybody should expect that it's not always going to go well as an employee <laughs> and it's not personal. You know, if, if you get the pink slip, it's not personal. It's just, it's your time. But uh, you know, for most people, when they leave one job, they find something better. And that certainly happened for me. I think my, what I learned and the experience I had with Calgary scientific was unbelievable. And it's led me to where I am today, where uh, I'm probably, um, just as jazz, but what I'm doing every day as I've ever been. Yeah, thank thank you for sharing um, that personal experience with us. So um, that's really uh, the end of it. Um, and uh, I have a, some closing remarks to say, but um, let's thank uh, Pierre for the presentation and the engaging Q&A. So thank you, Pierre, <laughs> very much. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the audience. Thank you for joining us today and contributing to the conversation. And again, the video of today's um, alumni effect will be posted on the alumni section of our website. And the link was in the chat if you would still like to look for that. Uh, we have um, upcoming events and uh, the University of Website has information about those. The next Alumni Effect speaker uh, lecture will be on May 23, and will feature Milo Anderson, the director and founder of newhomelistingservice.com, who is a real estate agent now developing land in Mexico and Guatemala. Guatemala. So thank you again, Pierre. Uh, it was great to uh, spend this time with you. And um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And until we see each other again, all the best. Thank you very much. My pleasure.